This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. And now, on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome to... We're watching here! We're watching here! This is Opinionated Movie Talk with Chris and Perry. My name is Chris Williams. With me, he is the Hawkeye to my Trapper John, Perry Seibert. I was curious if you do that or, 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 or do you go with the character names. And either way, you can't lose. I, okay. I, was, I was hoping that when I said you were the Hawkeye, you would be able to do the whistle. There you go. <laughs> How are you doing? He's going to whip it out later in the show, but that's fine. There you I'm go. great. I'm great. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing pretty good. It's uh, we're in November, so we're like in the good movie time of the year. And uh, yeah, so it's been nice. I've been going to the theaters a lot and looking forward to going a lot more as the holidays come. Um, we are going to get into our Robert Altman marathon today. We're going to start with a discussion of 1970s MASH in just a little bit. I'm excited to get into that. Perry, what have you been watching? I got, I got a couple things to talk about. Uh, let's start on the small screen. Okay. Uh, it's, it's been fun with uh, my oldest being home uh, for a bit. We, uh, My wife and Emma and I have been trying to find shows to all watch together. And uh, we, I think we talked last time about how we went through. Uh, we finished Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, which we talked okay. about briefly. And I remember you saying you hadn't finished the last season. I encourage you to do so. That's we, show are, that's, we somehow stopped. With like three or four episodes left. I don't know oh, why we never. I don't know why. And it wasn't like a, we don't like this. I think I wasn't feeling the last season as much. But I wasn't. Oh. I wasn't not liking it. It was just probably another shiny show came up. And we were like, oh, let's watch that. Sure. And never got around to it. And I need to do it because I do like that show. I think it's a show that actually gets stronger. Uh, after that, I think those last two seasons are remarkably good, like surprisingly good. Mm-hmm. It, it deepens the show. I, I liked it a lot. But what I want to mention was Hacks. We went through. Uh, we went through all of Hacks, the HBO series. Th- oh, about a, okay. About the female stand-up comic and the young female writer who uh, writes her helps write her a new hour of material. Yeah, that's a good show. I recommend Hacks. <laughs> that is a really smart show about comedy. A smart show about performers. And a show that manages to be uh, a, a show that managed to have a very strong female standpoint just because there are two solid female characters mm-hmm. who run it, not because it's going out of its way to do that. It's very savvy. Uh, it's really well acted. I had no idea until I was about four episodes in that the young woman is Lorraine Newman's daughter. So yeah, I, I love a good SNL connection. And uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a really strong a piece of work that you can blow through 10 episodes half hour each well and Jean smart she's been having like just a real run lately um i forget what the show wasn't she on mayor of east town she was on mayor of east town okay she was on uh watchman yes it's watchman she's, hbo is her new home okay yes watchman she is fantastic and i don't know if you've seen watchman um, we are actually halfway through it right oh, now. oh god watchman is so good i i love watchman in a show full of fantastic performances by women and people of color, I find it prob. I hope it's not just my own whatever bias I don't recognize. Saying Tim Blake Nelson walks off with the whole thing. He's great. <laughs> He's unbelievably great in it. But yes, it's it's interesting. I'm I'm withholding judgment till I finish it because I have no faith in Damon Lindelof at all. So I am. I, I want to know that I'm not going to have the rug pulled out from under me. Did you watch The Leftovers? I did not. Okay, that's one that's been recommended to me by multiple people. And that's the same hang up I had was I was burned on Lost and I was burned on Uh Prometheus. And uh, Uh it's like, (laughs) I I don't know, but I've heard enough people recommend that. And I dug where Watchmen ended up. So, yeah, I'm excited to hear hear what you think when you end it. It, it, I, I dug it. And movie wise, I uh, just the other day. Uh, caught up with uh, Eyes of Tammy Faye. Oh, that I, I need to get around to that in the next week or so. Which I will say that I liked uh, for for uh, the the biggest reason I liked it is it walks this amazing edge of 
not not satirizing her to the point that it's mocking her okay it's a really interesting thing it's a it's it it tackles a thing we've talked about a lot and something we both really like which is it's really about the price you pay for living a moral life for choosing to live by a particular moral code what does that cost you what do you pay to do that and interestingly uh, most, most, I, I find that most things that do that, you know, set up the protagonist as some sort of uh, almost too good to be true figure. And here you've got a character who is, uh, who uh, putting it in the terms of the movie, sins and recognizes that about herself. And you see her tackle her wrestle with that at the level at which she is intellectually and emotionally capable of doing that which is really interesting without without it being a mock of that at all it's a really interesting tone it hits uh and i i I really respected that it managed to find that and stay with it the whole way and the other thing i will say is i have said i have said unkind things about jessica chastain in the past because i think she has I find her never able to lose all of her self-consciousness. I always feel like she knows she's being watched, Mm -hmm. which can be used to advantage in various ways. But I will tell you, uh, you know, this movie happened in large part because she wanted to play this part. She, she wanted to do this. And the character is so guileless and she is a good actress. She really is. I mean, she's, she's a fine actress. I I don't, I, I don't think Jessica Chastain is untalented. Um, but she so commits to playing this utterly guileless character who seems to, she is driven towards an audience, but not because she needs that validation. She just kind of is. And this is, <laughs> Tammy Faye is surprisingly so comfortable in her own skin, which is a ridiculous phrase to use when talking about Tammy Faye Baker, <laughs> that, uh, that, that she manages to completely embody that. It's my favorite Jessica Chastain performance <laughs> ever. <laughs> I'm not saying it's the best film she's ever been in, but she's very good here. And she's, uh, I, I can't imagine her not in the Oscar race. Okay. Um, I like both of those actors, her and Andrew Garfield. And yes, I, everybody's good. I was really slow to learn this was directed by Michael Showalter. Who I really too. like him too. And uh, yeah, Big Sick was um, one of my favorite films a few years back. And mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of him. Uh, and given my He's background, it, it's like it's a surprise I didn't see this opening weekend. And just this week, <laughs> as I was thinking, like, oh, I need to start catching up on some end of the year stuff. I was like, oh, that's right, that Tammy Faye movie came out, and I saw it was on Amazon, and I think I rented it, and I need to get around to it in the next week or so. It's surprisingly watchable. It's too long. Okay, the last act is a bit of a drag, uh, and I don't know that the end lands like they want it to. Uh, they take a big swing and I respect that. I don't think it, you know, I don't think it falls apart or anything, but they make a very, there's a, there's a choice. There's an artistic choice on the ending. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so I respect it for making a choice. I don't know if it works or not, but I, I respect it for making it. it. It plays a lot like those really great HBO films from about 10, 15 years ago. Like, okay. Okay. Yeah. Like, uh, 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 I blank on both of them, but the, the political, the, the hanging Chad movie, yeah, uh, um, it, it plays. And... It plays like those. Not again. The tone is a little different in that it really is way more humane than you might expect. The movie isn't as funny as you expect it to be, uh, and it's not as melodramatic as you expect it to be. But it is both of those things, <laughs> and, okay. and, and really the correct amount of doses. It's a surprising film. Okay, and and, <laughs> and, and not great, not perfect, <laughs> not a world beater, but I I liked it. Cool. I am looking forward to that. Did you have anything else you'd seen or? No, nah, that's enough. I've yacked way too much. Chris, what okay. have you seen? Well, I'm going to start at the, uh, I, I have three that I've seen recently. And one of them, I'm just kind of exercising a demon. Um, so <laughs> I'll, I'll start at the I... low end and we'll build up. Uh, so last week, <laughs> I don't watch a lot of screeners anymore. I don't go to a lot of screenings anymore. Um, I'd like to get back into that. But like right now, it's just not something I'm doing much, but the fine folks over at Disney plus sent me a screener for a movie called home sweet home alone. (laughs) Um, 
I was 10 years old when Home Alone came out in 1990. Okay. Uh, and I guess it would have been 11. Um, I was the perfect age for Home Alone. It is a movie we watch every Christmas. And I will admit, I'm quite fond of. I, I think it's not a great movie, but it gets the job done for me. And there's a lot of nostalgia doing the heavy lifting. Sure. Um, but I also do think it makes some choices where I'm like, it's better than it has a right to be. I, I do dig the Christmas look and the John Williams score. And I think Joe Pesci really brings something there. And, you know, it satisfies that Looney Tune urge that I have. Um, sure. The rest of the sequels, uh, there are now six Home Alone movies. Um, <laughs> I've only seen the uh, second one, which I don't like. It, it's awful. Um, I skipped the rest and then I decided, OK, I'll give this reboot a chance because I'm home with my kids. They like Home Alone. This might be right up their alley. And what could it hurt? Right. I like I like this cast. Pete Holmes is in it. Ellie Kemper's in it. Rob Delaney's in oh. it. These are all oh, good people who I enjoyed so watching. Sad that Ellie Kemper's wasting your time on that. Oh, <laughs> I, I think the best review for this is I'm watching this with my kids and about an hour into it, my six-year-old daughter looks at me and says, dad, can I just go to bed? Ah! Oh, if the six-year-old chooses bedtime over a movie, that's rough. And the thing is, I have a video on Instagram of her watching the first Home Alone movie last Christmas, and she's going nuts for it. She loves it. She's laughing. She wanted nothing to do with this. (laughs) And I'm just going to say, I'm not going to get into a whole diatribe. I wrote 2,000 words about why I dislike this movie, and they are up on my newsletter, which I will mention at the end of this podcast. There are 2,000 words. I read them. (laughs) I don't understand why you would place a couple at the center of this movie who is going through awful financial times about to lose their home worrying about how their kids are going to have a Christmas and then make them the ones who are battered through the entire movie. It's such a (laughs) baffling bad choice. And if Disney doesn't do anything well, or if Disney does one thing, well, it's brand management. It's understanding what the appeal of something is, what the brand of something is, and how to replicate that over and over until you're sick of it. They totally whiffed on this one. Like they can't even get home alone right, which is like the most basic thing if you're trying to get a kid audience. Um, <laughs> it's one of the worst things I've ever seen. I hated it. Um, you know, it, it's awful, but I had to get that off my chest. Good. I'm I glad did. You did. I, I, I will real quick say I had a chance to go out Saturday to do a double feature. Um, and I did see both Belfast and Spencer. And I enjoy both of those movies quite a bit. Really? Okay. I'm yeah. very excited for Belfast. I can't believe I haven't seen it yet because I have a giant soft spot for Kenneth Branagh. But tell me about Spencer. Sure. Because uh, I haven't I've have not read much. I, mm-hmm. I mean I know what it is, but I haven't I haven't I haven't heard, talked to anybody who's seen it. Yeah, um, and and I think you'll enjoy Belfast. It's a charming, lovely little movie. I liked it quite a bit. Um, It's a great trailer. It's a great trailer. It really is. Uh, Spencer is a movie I thought I'd have no interest in because I really have never cared about the royal family. I never paid much attention to Princess Diana. Uh, This is Pablo Lorraine. I don't even think I saw his uh, Jackie Kennedy movie. Um, So I I kind of was totally walking in blind to this, and it was really only good reviews that uh, got me in there. And it really, it, it's a story about princess Diana over a long Christmas weekend near the end of her marriage to Prince Charles. Uh, she goes to the Royal estate to spend a traditional Christmas weekend. And it's just about how she feels the weight of all these years of tradition and history, just ripping apart her core personality and identity. And Kristen Stewart plays Diana. She is fantastic. Um, She understands how to play someone who the world is paying so much attention to. And she knows the eyes of the world are on her. She cannot be herself in private or in public. And she's kind of coming apart because of that. Um, It's a really strong performance. I love the setting of this by kind of just focusing on this weekend and placing it at this estate She's in this situation where history is 
literally on all the walls around her, like staring down at her. And you get the feeling of just how history and tradition are suffocating her. And it, it's a really well done psychological portrait. Um, it kind of takes some, it, it, it kind of goes big. Uh, I, I think there are some things that could be on the nose, but you're dealing with a very iconic person. And I don't know how you deal with that without being a little bit on the nose and, and a little bit big. Um, but yeah, Kristen Stewart's fantastic. Timothy Spall's in it, and he's really good. Um, Sean Harris is really good. Sally Hawkins is really good. Uh, it, it's a very well done movie. I, I, yeah, I was the only person in the theater for the whole thing. And, uh, that, that was great too, but, um, no, I really enjoyed this. This, I'd, I'd be curious what you think about it. It's, it's really well done. I, I was, I am interested. I, I was interested in the, I, I, I like Kristen Stewart, mm-hmm. but I, I find, I, so did you ever see Seberg? Her Gene Seberg biopic. I don't think I did. A few years no. ago. So I, I, I find it interesting when she chooses to take on these characters that you so rightly talked about, people who are the center of attention. Uh, it's obvious that she has some very, you know, she feels very close to those feelings. Rightfully sure. so. I understand why. But uh, I don't, I, I was curious why she would want to do this again so quickly <laughs> by playing Princess Diana. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's, that it's good. I am, I am eager to check it out for, for all of those reasons. Yeah, I also I really didn't it. much care for Jackie. I thought okay. Jackie was, I thought Jackie was just swinging a miss for a, at a lot of levels. Okay, uh, and I was in the minority on that. I will gladly admit most people really seem to be taken by it. Uh, but yes, knowing that you enjoyed it that much, I am even more intrigued. I, it's I worth need a look. to get to both of those. It is worth a look, and those are that's out in theaters right now. Um, but we're going to flash back for this episode. Now we're going to start our Robert Altman discussion, which. Just a little inside baseball. Um, we're probably not going to do a Robert Altman discussion every episode for the next few months. Um, we'll hit this for a few episodes. We'll stop to talk some new movies. Our schedule kind of changes. We see things where we're like, hey, let's talk about this. Um, but we are going to try and dial down and see a bunch of Robert Altman films over the next few months. And I'm really excited. This kind of grew out of our 1970s series. And I think we were talking offline about, well, what movies do we include? And you brought up a few Robert Altman movies. And I was like, well, I don't think I've ever seen a Robert Altman movie. Uh, He's actually a horrible blind spot for me. And you jumped right on that. We're like, oh, we're going to do a Robert Altman miniseries. And I'm really excited about this because he has been someone who's been a blind spot for me for a long time. I mean, he was making movies before I was born, which is probably why I didn't see a lot of his movies. But, um, you know, reading Roger Ebert's great movies and stuff, he pops up quite a bit. And yes. he's always been on my list and just never got around. And uh, yeah, why, why were you so excited about taking on Robert Altman? Uh, be, for, I mean, for a bunch of reasons. An excuse to watch, all, you know, many of the Altman films again. I'll jump at it any time. I, I was very curious how you would react to Altman. Uh, because I, I, I mean, I have a hunch. I, I think I know where where how you will arc over this. I think okay. I know what films I will like better than you. Okay. And I think I know what films you will like better than I do. Um, and it's also a really good Altman. Altman to me is so so important because we've talked a lot about. There's that book that you love the uh, the it's it's the Harris book right about uh, films from revolution. Yes, the best yes. Picture nominees from '67. Yep. So to me. Altman represents the purest, genuine, classical 60s definition of counterculture sensibility that ever took hold in Hollywood. Okay. Uh, from one artist over an extended period of time who really had no interest in maintaining a traditional film career at all. Altman was not in it for the celebrity. <laughs> this is what he did. He liked the work. And the only reason I, I and you always it's so great that you haven't seen any of these to get to start with MASH. Uh, if, if, because if you only know MASH from the TV show, you have no understanding of what the movie is. Yeah. <laughs> and best of all, it, to, to, to start off this, to put to get some proper perspective to why this is important. So uh, MASH was such a phenomenal hit 
that if you uh, if you go look at the box office mojo list of adjusted for inflation, the biggest box office hits of all time, MASH is 97th. Wow. Now, that might not sound impressive, but I would like to give you this quick list of films that it is higher than, okay, adjusting for inflation. All of the Harry Potter films except the first one. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Ghost. <laughs> to put some 90s spin on this. Frozen. It oh, has God. made more money than Frozen if you adjust for inflation. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> So just to give you some idea <laughs> of how culturally huge the movie MASH was, not mm-hmm. just that it launched a TV series that lasted for 11 years. Uh, it's, it's a really, it, it is one of those giant, giant box office smashes of the counterculture. Yes, the graduate adjusted for inflation has more money, but this is, this is only a couple hundred million behind it when you make those adjustments. And that's real. it's, it's, it is a film that is incredibly problematic as I'm sure we will talk about oh, yeah. <laughs> over the next <laughs> few minutes. But, uh, but, uh, but Altman found a new way to tell stories and he spent 1970 to 1975 systematically attacking every single classic Hollywood genre with this, with this aesthetic that he came up with and this very counterculture sensibility. And that's definitely in place here. I definitely noticed that. Um, Like you said, I did not know MASH except for the TV show, which I'll even confess, I don't know the TV show super well because I I think MASH ended in 1982 and I was three years old. So it's definitely something that I caught on syndication as a kid and totally went over my head. As an adult, I think I've seen a few more episodes and been like, oh, that show was a little bit deeper than I thought, a little more sincere and serious and just definitely reading up on TV history and things like that. I know it has a reputation for a show that could balance silliness and sincerity very well. It was a show that did, especially in its later seasons, go very serious and and would often stop for introspective episodes. And I think I was kind of prepared for MASH the movie to be that balance of silly and sincere (laughs) And I was very surprised that this movie does not stop to go sincere. Um, It it is. I'm going to say something first off, just to let our listeners know who haven't seen MASH. uh, It is based on a novel. Uh, It it follows three surgeons, three army surgeons uh, during the Korean War as they get into a variety of hijinks as they're out in the field. Um, I'm going to say something when I talk about my reaction to this movie that is going to sound like a pejorative and I don't mean it this way Mm -hmm. when I was done (laughs) the movie this reminded me the most of was a police academy movie um oh but but if a police academy movie had had actual kind of competence behind it but was also (laughs) also fueled by anger uh this yeah. is a this is a movie that like it, it, when i say it's a police academy it's people having hijinks that are reacting to authority right it is not super far from removed from what they would end up doing with like the slobs versus snobs movies in the end in the 80s it just has a soul to it and you can feel even almost well more than 50 years later you can feel that anger and frustration because it is a movie about people who are laughing and taking something a bit flippantly in places because that's the only way to keep from going mad and crying. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it was definitely a movie that I, I don't, I don't know if I find it as funny as people in 1970 would have found it. Um, right. But I, I think there is a, there's a skill to it, which we can definitely talk about. And just an underlying anger. Obviously, it's Korea standing in for Vietnam uh, when this absolutely. Was and you can just feel the anger at the incompetence of some of the most revered institutions. Um, just this railing against authority, this railing against trying to make sense of the unsensible, sending people to die. Uh, there's a very strong anti-religious bent in this movie uh that's there 
Well, um, to be fair, there's an anti-hypocrisy. Yes, yes. I don't, it's not really anti-religious. It's anti-hypocrisy. I mean, it's yes. anti-everything that's structure and order. So yes, at some level, it's anti-religion. But the film goes out of its way to what it rewards is competency. Yes. I mean, that's above all else, that will make you okay in this world. Yeah. You have to be good at your job and be focused on the, the right things to focus on. Yeah. And one thing that kind of surprised me because I, I just didn't, obviously the TV show couldn't do this. Um, and we're probably going to jump all over on this, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, I was surprised how gory the surgical scenes are. Yes. How, how straight those scenes are. Like they're, they're not, you know, they're kind of bantering between them, but that's, they're, they're serious moments. They're dealing with life and death. There is blood spurting around. There are, there's a scene where Donald Sutherland is hacksawing someone's limb off. Um, and it struck me how vital those scenes are, because if you don't show how skilled Hawkeye and Trapper John are at their job, then their flippancy and their humor doesn't work because they right. have to be good at that job to push against the people who are not good at their jobs at all, which is basically all army leadership in this movie. Yes, absolutely true. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly how the army leadership is portrayed throughout the movie. Yes, absolutely. Um, and as someone who's worked alongside the military, not too far off. <laughs> Your angry letters to Chris Williams. <laughs> huh? Well, no, I mean, what <laughs> No, I know. I, 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 I worked with the army for several years as a contractor. And so I had, I had opportunities to be around enlisted men and women and sometimes people who were fairly high up and you would see this really, it's like the Peter principle in action in government. It's like you show sure. up, you, you show up, you kiss the right butts, you're going to move up and you're going to get an extra star. And there are people who are serving there who that's all they want is to get that extra star and get in that position of power. And they don't know what the hell they're doing. And that is what you see in Robert Duvall's character. Um, you see that in uh, Hot Lips quite a bit. Um, it's really how army leadership is portrayed. They're pushing against these people who are fairly incompetent, very self-centered, and they're, they've got people's lives in their hands um, th that, that they're losing, basically. And what else can yes. you do to keep from screaming about that? But, you know, kind of play some practical jokes and take it, take lightly what you can. Yes. And yes. And aim those practical jokes at, at mostly at the people who are incompetent. Yes. <laughs> and are costing lives. Yes. And are unable to accept their responsibility for what they're supposed to be doing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, with the with the glaring exception that I will say up top, the film is uh, just painfully misogynistic. <laughs> yeah, just un you know, uh, unforgivable is the right word. Although I forgive it because I think the film's incredibly funny. So I understand that's a, that's a, that's an unfair word to use, a dishonest word on my behalf to use. Uh, but it really is, you know, the film the film does fall apart around the Hot Lips character. It really doesn't. <laughs> play true to the rules it's trying to lay out for itself with her, which is uh, patentedly unfair. And you know what else was patently unfair? Vietnam. So really, <laughs> that's really the excuse of why you can get away with this. We are just screaming at the void at this point. And so we're going to, we're, we're going to accept that that's there and say that that's horrible and not funny. But, uh, you know, if you want to, you can chalk that up to the outlook at the time. There was nothing funny. There was nothing funny going on, really. It was all very dark. Well, and I, I think going back to what you're saying about, you know, the film making fun of hypocrisy, there are two moments that two big pranks that are pulled at the expense of the Hot Lips character um, that I think stand out to one area where the movie kind of gets away with it and one where it doesn't. So the prank they pull where she's in her bunk with uh, Robert Duvall's character and yes. they turn it on the radio. That works for me because it is, it, it, it's a joke played on two people who have been, you know, portraying themselves as kind of above it all. And, yes. and, and you know, it, it's, it's calling out their hypocrisy and exactly. And their own inability to follow the rules. The gag later on, 
where they yeah, lift up these shower stalls. It's yeah, unforgivable. And I from think, a moral standpoint, there's no yeah. Well, and does that come after the fa- after the scene where Trapper John has told her you're a good nurse? Yes. It okay. Does. Yeah. Is, that, it's, it's 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 a terrible scene for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, not the least of which is they have a bunch of women there to sort of act as well. The, the women are taking part in this too, as some sort of way to sort of not that they're even concerned about having it make sense. And mm-hmm. what's even worse is the the scene that follows in which her outrage is there to be made fun of. Yeah, like that's that's really bad. It, it's yeah. the worst sequence in the film, and you could absolutely cut out. And it wouldn't really hurt the movie. Yeah. So yeah. yes, it is. It is a. It is a. It is a very very old sensibility. Altman was, you know, Altman was not a young man in nineteen. I mean, he was young, but he was not a. He was not in his twenties when he made Mash. He was older than that. Okay. And so, you know, is obviously from a time in which that would have been not even thought of. You know, you wouldn't make this consideration whatsoever. It, it is a it, it, it and that's that's unfortunate, especially with fifty years of hindsight attached to it. I, I'll still defend the film all the way through. I think it's well, for, for, not just for the content, but for as I as I hope I'll get into. You know, this is the film that introduces Altman's discoveries of how he can use sound, yeah. which is to just basically mic everybody, put the camera as far away as you want, and then just bring up the levels on whoever is having the most interesting conversation. No, I definitely really? like the 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 scenes where the camera is just panning over that tent of like the mess hall or the surgical yeah. theater and people are in and there are jokes like that's the thing. It's not just murmuring. It's not just, you know, random conversation. There are jokes layered in. I had thankfully I had subtitles on and I could like yes. pick them all out. But yeah, it, it's they're not throwaway lines. It's not just someone sitting there going, you know, watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. It's that you got to listen carefully. There are jokes in there that are funny and very deadpan and they're kind of just bouncing off each other. And it's really fun to watch and you got to keep on your toes with it. Yes. And you will see that evolve over the next few films. Okay. It is, it is impressive what, how, how he applies that to, uh, to genres you don't see or hear that way ever before. Well, what's really funny, I just finished, I think you had recommended this book to me. I just finished reading Sidney Lumet's book, uh, Making Movies. Oh, um, so good. It's is really good. Yeah. And there, there is a section, I was thinking about it as I watched this, because I'm not sure how, how early this movie was at capturing that kind of crosstalk. But Lumet writes about when recording sound, you had to wait for someone else to be done before you could say your line, because the sounds would not sync up. And I was thinking about that, like, is this one of the early movies to get people talking this far over each other? Yes. And it, it really, it adds a liveliness. I know Spielberg would do that a lot, too, with kids, um, you know, a few years down the road from this. But mm-hmm. it really adds a lot of liveliness. It adds a texture to this. Um, yeah, no, that I, I definitely noticed that. And I like how this movie isn't filmed like a comedy. Like, this is not an overlit you know, cheap looking movie. This looks pricey. This looks real. And I think that makes, I, I want to say the comedy, I, I will be honest, like the big pranks and stuff largely fell flat for me. Like we can get around to the football game. That was excruciating for me. <laughs> um, but yes, what I love what made me laugh over and over was just in this gore soaked war zone watching Elliot Gould and Donald Sutherland just strut around. It, yes. It's a joy just to watch them. Just They always look like there is something up between them. And yes, they're charisma machines. And I was, you know, as someone who's only used to Alan Alda when it comes to MASH, I mean, Donald Sutherland, yes. not Alan Alda. He's he's really fun to watch. And not that Alan Alda isn't a delight, but uh, of course. it's a totally different chemistry he brings to it. And he just always looks like he's getting away with something. It reminded me of a prototypical kind of like Bill Murray role from the eighties. Like just the guy who sees the yes. smartest in the room and he's going to get away with this. And if he doesn't, Absolutely. he doesn't care because everyone like there's a scene and this is Elliot Gould 
but uh, where he he punches out Robert Duvall's character. Yes. And they come in and they're like, oh, arrest him. And he's just like, come on. Like he knows they're not going to arrest him. He's their best surgeon. He knows he can get yes. away with anything. I, yes, love that scene. Love uh, Gould and Sutherland are, you know, two superb actors. They always have been. Sutherland, I think, is one of the most underrated actors in the history of movies. He's given brilliant performances in each of the last seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, six decades. Mm-hmm. I, I, he's he's a fabulous actor. Gould, you know, you know, flew too close to the sun by the mid seventies, <laughs> fell on some hard times. But is a fantastic actor, especially, and you're going to see it. He, you know, he and he and Altman connected very deeply, and Gould will become a major figure. Uh, over the next uh, over the next few years uh, you're going to see at least one and i hope uh two no yeah at least uh, definitely one hopefully two of his my favorite illegal performances which are in uh some more alden films that are coming up okay i'm looking forward to that he's he's fun to watch here um robert Fact. duvall did, did robert duvall ever look young <laughs> no because <laughs> i'm thinking back to no. even did Boo radley look young no. yeah okay he's yeah. never looked young <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I, I mean, the performances are a lot of fun here. I, I yeah, I, I don't know what else to see about this, but there's a lot of places we could dig in. Um, what, what do you have to say else about this? Because I feel like I've been uh, rambling. No, just, I, I think we've, we've touched on it. You know, it was truly a counterculture sensibility, mm-hmm. not, not, it wasn't some grand attempt to be a big box office hit. It was a film that was the, the studio at the time was dealing with two super budgeted war films. This was the, this was their third war and they weren't paying any attention because it didn't cost anything compared to the other two. So they got away with so much. They were allowed to do so much, uh, you know, to attack the sensibility that had us still in Vietnam in 1970. That is, that is was not done in Hollywood. I mean, it's 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 a case of something like the big star albums, where you know you're so used to what this has wrought mm. that the power of the original just doesn't hit like it should. You can't fully appreciate what what this film was doing, how it was so different, and that's why I wanted to lead talking about how the box office for it is so significant and, and how big an impact it had on the culture at the time. And it, it, I mean, it's a straight line from, you know, you go police academy. That's interesting. You know, for me, it's the obvious antecedent or the obvious proceed from this is Animal House. I mean, that's obviously the next step. Well, also that's, Donald Sutherland. And by that time, right. And there's another seven mm-hmm. years of permission or of, 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 of permissive stuff that can be shown on screen by that point. So, yeah, that's if you like Animal House, you should definitely see MASH if you haven't. I mean, it's, 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 there's a, there's a direct line there. And the other thing I'll say that I, 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 the story that I like best that I just read this year from that fantastic uh, Mike Nichols biography. Okay. Where, you know, Mike Nichols was shooting Catch-22 at the same time this is shooting and Catch-22 took a lot longer to shoot. And so Catch-22 is, is got, you know, there's some time left to shoot on it and they're editing it. And Nichols sees MASH and realizes, oh, they they absolutely beat me. Uh, my my film is pointless. But they they did everything I was trying to do with this film and I have failed. <laughs> so not only have I failed to do what I want to do with this movie, somebody's actually done it better. And it sent him into a very big funk, oh. <laughs> which he he did more than once throughout his life. But uh, but as always with Mike Nichols, he, he was right. He was right. This is it's a much better movie than Catch-22. Well, yeah, I mean, the fact that you can still feel the anger 50 years later, like th- this is a movie that has something to say. It's not just, you know, I, Police Academy is definitely what came to mind, but Police Academy isn't really, you know, angry about the situation yes. of our law enforcement. If only police, if only in Police Academy, they were good at being cops. Yes. That alone would have made it funnier. But no, what? they can't bother with that. One thing I've been kind of going back and forth on since seeing the movie is there's the scene where Trapper John and Hawkeye go to Japan and yes. there's, um, you know, they go and they're excited to golf and things like that. But then they learn there's this infant that they could, uh, you know, they, they could help out. They could, they could operate on it and the army's going to frown on that. 
but they blackmail the um, they blackmail the captain at that base yes. uh, so they can treat this kid. And then after that, it's, you know, another half hour football game. Um, and, and I think <laughs> when I ended the movie, I was really frustrated because I was like, oh, no, that ending with the kid should ha- or the, the scene with the kids should have been the climax of the movie. It's it's, you know, them exposing the hypocrisy of the military. It's it's them showing that, uh, you know, the military is not doing the right thing and they're going to do the right thing and they're going to stand up. And then the more I thought about it, I'm like, but it really seems to make more the point of the movie that the army would probably think a lot more about the results of a football game than treating yes. a little foreign kid. And, and it actually, I, I yes. came around to that. Cause I'm like, yeah, that actually Good. I'm glad emotionally kind of rankled me, but I'm like, no, that's in keeping with the anger of the movie and kind of pushing up against the bureaucracy. I wish the football game was funnier and did not have a racial slur uh, repeated several times through it. Um, well, you know, he used to throw the javelin. Yeah. I will say though, that one scene that did make me laugh in the football, the football game is where they, they knock one of the opposing team's members so out of it that he thinks he's at the Olympics. A track that, meet. He's yeah, at a track, at a track meet. meet. Yes. And yes. so it's, they shoot the yes. pistol and he runs and like runs and tackles the cheerleaders. And, and he I did barrels into the cheerleaders. Yes. That's the best. They spend so much time to set that up and they pay, they pay it off really well. It, I, I also, I, and for the sheer subversiveness of it, I enjoy them crashing into all of the guys that are there in wheelchairs. I think that's just, <laughs> just so subversively funny that I, 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 I also, I like that moment. Yes. The football game goes on too long. Uh, it again, just it, again, it's, it's, uh, it's a very bad use of, of the hot lips character yet again, making actually making her an idiot, which you yes. established earlier. She isn't. Uh, it's terrible at that, about that, but I, it's worth it for me to have this big set piece to get to that ending, which is, you know, you talk about where they treat the infant, the, the, the Japanese infant and all, you know, the, if you care to read deeper into this, there is a subtext there that I don't think Altman wants to lean into terribly because it doesn't really fit the sensibility of the time, but it's still there if you want to look at it. There, there's nobody dealing with real emotions at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, you know, even the goodbye yes. between the two characters is thrown away. Literally, I mean, I mean, it is not. There's no moment where you get to go. Oh yeah, there's no nostalgia for this time, it, even in the moment. There's no, it, you know, it, it's the antithesis of the ending of Mash the TV show, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. that's if you want to go one step further and say, well, this is also the result of having to be around all that carnage. You know, you really do. The, you are really cutting yourself off from everything, which, again, I don't think is the intention you're supposed to take from the movie. Um, mm. But I think it's there. If you want to talk about it, still kind of being on point for dealing with trauma and what that does to a human being over over uh, you know ex- exposed to so much trauma over a very brief period of time I, you know i think there's a good essay there to write if you want to write it i think it's there i think you're right i i don't i think you could read i, I think you could read chapter john is just you know his goodbye is just being you know kind of the i'm going to get emotional without being emotional type thing like i'll just get out here don't say goodbye to me but i, th- I think there's something in what you're saying too that this is they're they're not gonna deal with the trauma they're they're being under. They're not they're gonna they're gonna just, you know, kind of laugh at the meaningless of it all. Like there is really this feeling right. that everything that's going on is meaningless. Like you're you're patching up people who are gonna be sent out to die. Um th- like that's the, the I, I thought of a little bit more about that. The movie doesn't really bring that up, but it is there that you're patching people up, but the army's you know, wants you to patch them up so they can send them back out to fight and die. Right. Exactly. That's the whole craziness. And especially, you know, if you think of this as being about Vietnam, you can feel that just kind of frustration and bewilderment there. Um, Yeah. yeah, Or even our most recent conflicts. I mean, it's anytime you go to war, this movie's going to be relevant. Um, 
Yeah. I, I will mention too, this is not a serious thing, but it's a running gag I really liked was the um the PA announcer throughout the movie constantly getting it wrong, like just stumbling. And I, I noticed it because I had subtitles on, like I said, and you would just notice it would be little stutters or he would say something and then contradict himself. But then it plays off in something I don't know that I've ever seen a movie do where it calls attention to the fact that you're watching a movie in the very last moment where his PA is yeah. you've been watching MASH and this is the cast. And I just yeah. thought that was a nice little gag to end on. I can only think of one other film that comes close to doing that. And it's not quite the same thing, but it's it's close. And it actually predates, I think it predates MASH. So there's this, uh, there's this very odd film called Skidoo. Are you familiar okay. at all with Skidoo? I have heard of it. I have not seen it. Skidoo stars Jackie Gleason. It was, I believe it was directed by Otto Preminger. Uh, and it's, it's a, basically it's, uh, it's the generation before the counterculture making a movie about LSD. It's okay. very odd. It doesn't work. It's a fascinating time capsule, but the music for Skidoo was, uh, was done by Harry Nilsson, who's an artist. I, adore beyond all measure and um harry composed the end song in which he literally sings the end credits oh god it's fantastic wow <laughs> it's gotta be on youtube it's, it's, it's oh you can find the song okay it's okay. a great song um it's really brilliant but yes i love the fact that mash ends with literally yes a recitation of the actors and you see yeah. you just hear their names and see their faces and that's it to pull you out of this this world that you've been this world of 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 gore and nothingness that you've been in for the last yeah. two hours and i was shocked to learn how popular this is i think it was like the third highest grossing movie of that year which is yeah crazy to think about like it's not a superhero movie and I, I mean obviously none of them were superheroes or big event movies at that time but a very bloody um ribald comedy was number three at the box office and and still in the top 100 adjusted that's, for inflation. That's, that is it's crazy. Amazing. That's yeah. It is. It really is. People uh, people don't understand how easy it was for them to greenlight the TV show based on this. And to be fair, I mean Altman Altman came from directing a lot of TV and uh, old fashioned like industrial films. Um, he made a couple of features before this, but this was his big chance to do something, and he took it. Uh, and it's worth noting that he he got nothing from the tv show like he, no he he had he had no power and so it wasn't like he was going to get anything out of any residuals off off that so it is worth noting that he stays very pure <laughs> in this counterculture ideal when it comes to the massive amount of box office that came towards mash's way and, but and it he, bought him fi- he made he made eight films in five years starting from, from mash to nashville 70 to 75 is eight features and he only could pull that off because mash was so gargantuan a hit that is insane and i look forward to getting through those movies um do you have anything else to say on mash no i think we did a good job i think we did um awesome glad you did that uh yeah i i'm glad i saw this i'm excited to to do this series this is gonna be fun um and we're gonna be back in a few weeks with another movie it might be an altman movie it might be i mean we're heading into end of the year there might be something else we we think about talking about we're going to talk about I, it in a little bit we'll go inside baseball i'm going to invite chris over to the uh, the cyber hacienda for a, an altman double feature i think we're going to do the next two together that will be awesome i'm looking forward to All that right. and i i will bring the drinks you're on you're All on right. a very dry martini you know of course you can't really savor a martini <laughs> without an olive well i'll bring the olives too <laughs> <laughs> perry where can people find you you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter at Perry Loves Film. And you can hear me every Friday morning on the Lucy Ann Lance show on WLBY 1290 AM in Ann Arbor. Chris, where can everybody read your stuff? You can find me at Criticisms on Substack, which the link will be in the show notes. Uh, there has been a ton of stuff coming on that in the last month or so um, because I somehow got ahead of myself and was able to start an editorial calendar and start writing things in advance. And 
I actually have some stuff lined up for the rest of the year that are that I'm really excited to to publish. So um, I have thoughts on new movies, thoughts on old movies. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mere Christianity. Uh, and this week, I believe I will also be back on the Seeing and Believing podcast. We are going to talk about Belfast. So they invited me on to talk about that. So, um, yeah, listen to that. Um, but be sure to come back in a few weeks and listen to uh, whatever Perry and I have in store next. And uh, we will see you then. <laughs>